Hey everybody, welcome to another U.S. History Screencast. Today we are going to be talking about uh, creating the Constitution, something that your students should actually have a little bit of background knowledge in. Um, should have learned it pretty much in every single, almost every single grade so far. So um, hopefully they have a little bit that you can build off of. And um, just in case you don't know which standard it is, this is the one we're going to be focusing on today. It's going to be Standard 5 which says investigate specific events and key ideas that brought about the adoption and implementation of the U.S. Constitution. So we're going to be looking at mainly the adoption of it, and then implementation will kind of come in later standards. Um, but we're going to focus more on the adoption today. So just like my other screencasts, I'm going to look backwards and then look forwards. So looking back, there's a fear of a person or a group of people having too much power. So, you know, essentially the reason why the American Revolution happened. Um, so in the creation of the Articles of Confederation during the Revolution, and obviously it stays around after the Revolution for a little while, um, you can really see the fear of having sort of one group or one person having too much power. Um, so essentially that's why it's so states' rights heavy. So it's kind of like a, a reaction to, to King George and kind of the uh, tyrannical government um, that many of the founders were sort of rebelling against. The downfall of the Articles of Confederation really comes with Shays' Rebellion. I don't know how in depth you go with this, but essentially under the Articles they could not collect federal taxes, and it's really tough to pay an army to put down a rebellion if you can't even pay them. Very quickly, after the new country is created, they find out that maybe they went a little too far away from, you know, that centralized power. And, you know, in order for people to listen to you, you do have to have a little bit of power um, in the national government. Looking ahead, the whole idea about how much power the government actually should have um, is obviously something that we still talk about today, so that's something you can bring back up over and over again in the class. Um, and that whole balance idea, um, you know, arguments about federalism, how much power should the state have, can states actually nullify federal laws, and that comes up obviously a couple different times, nullification, uh, the Civil War itself, and then even the legal, legalization of marijuana in modern times. So now that we've looked sort of backwards and forwards, let's jump into it. So uh, the first idea kind of is the growth of what we call factions, or essentially just groups of people that have the same beliefs. Um, and the two big ones are the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Um, and essentially it's the big idea of should we have a strong government or should we have a weak government? And we know where that comes from, fear of the king. Um, but then also fear of Shays' Rebellion at the same time. So that eventually leads to a lot of the arguments that come up in the Constitution itself. So um, one of the biggest ones, obviously, is separation of powers. So uh, one of the biggest misconceptions I've found with students is they think separation of powers and checks and balances is the same thing. But the whole idea of separating is huge. So not one person or one group having the power, but having three separate branches is key. And then what those branches can do to each other or check each other is the idea of checks and balances so that one branch does not gain too much power. So make sure they're able to differentiate between those two. Another uh, sort of balancing act is the idea of small and big states. So the big argument is about how many representatives each state should get. Um, so the biggest argument comes in to what is eventually called the Great Compromise and the reason why we have the House of Representatives and the Senate, one based off population, one has equal. Um, so obviously, if you're a little old state like New Jersey at this time, you're very afraid of people like Virginia who are going to make all the rules. And, you know, if you want to connect it to modern times with your students, you know, what if California, Texas and New York made the rules for essentially the rest of the country? That would potentially be an issue because life in California, Texas and New York might be different than, say, Georgia. Another discussion or really sort of non-discussion is uh, the idea of slavery. So we have the balance of cho uh, power between the North and the South. Uh, and you can see this kind of map change throughout history, but at the beginning, uh, it was very divided and essentially it will stay divided. But the whole argument is about, um, you know, should slaves count towards population? And really that's not an argument about population, it's an argument about representation. So the more people you have, the more power you have in government. Another big issue is the balance between individuals and government. So like we said over and over again. So the fear that one person or one group of people is gonna have too much power. So the anti-federalists were still afraid of this. This is the reason why the Bill of Rights were added immediately after, so this is protecting your individual rights. All of the first 10 amendments are set up in a way to save you from your government in case it 
becomes tyrannical. You know, looking back to the American Revolution, it makes total sense. Now, like I've said in my other screencasts, I want to give you all at least one thing that you can actually do in your classroom rather than talking about straight content. And I stole this one from another teacher, Ms. Torres, if you're watching, thank you. This is called a metaphorical categorization activity. So what you do um, is you may want to go over these in case your students have not taken government or they don't remember these ideas from eighth grade or maybe previous grades. So you may just want to do a quick overview of what these actually mean or you could just throw them in there uh, and see how they do either way. Um, but essentially what you're going to do is give them pictures uh, that have seemingly nothing to do with what you're doing. Um, but you're going to give them these pictures and make them put them into the six principles of government categories. And when they get done, so you know, give them X amount of time depending on how many pictures, like we always try and make our students do, make them explain why they put something in a particular category because they might think about a picture differently than maybe you did. So let me give you some examples from each category. Um, so let's start at the top left there. So with popular sovereignty, obviously, you know, someone lifting weights may not make total sense, but if the idea of popular sovereignty is the power from the government comes from the people, this is essentially saying this person is powerful and sort of lifting up the country. Um, so, you know, something that seemingly doesn't connect but can. Limited government, you have a bowling lane there. You cannot cross a line or else you will be penalized. So that really says that the government only has X amount of things that they're allowed to do. That illustrates that the power of the government is limited. And judicial review, this is just a big X because hopefully you remember that judicial review is essentially the only power of the Supreme Court, and that is to declare something unconstitutional. So uh, a big X, you know, they could really argue could go into a few other things too. So it really does matter what their argument is. Separation of powers. Um, I tried to, I tried to find the best free picture of the three musketeers that I could. So um, that is the three musketeers. So the whole idea that each musketeer kind of has their um, thing that they're good at or their personality type or whatever you want to call it. But together, um, they are able to sort of get a lot of stuff done but uh, it's not one of them outshining the rest or anything like that. Checks and balances is kind of a strange one, but I was thinking this is essentially insider trading going on with the handcuffs. So hopefully, um, you know, even though you could argue that this happens, uh, regardless, um, the idea that if someone does this and it's illegal, that someone is there to check their power. And the last one is probably the one that they're least likely to get. And this is actually an example that I give for them to help them understand federalism. And so, for example, in the school that you work in, there is a principal, there's administrators, and there's teachers, and obviously more people in there as well. Um, but it's sort of like the president and then sort of like the cabinet, or you could argue that uh, the teachers are kind of like the different states. And you could say, what if one teacher has different rules than the next teacher? And you could get into nullification um, you know, what if somebody lets you wear headphones in one class, but then you get in trouble in another class? So um, I kind of thought federalism made sense as far as the school goes, kind of the division of power. Uh, and you can take it pretty deep there with nullification if that is something you want to sort of add into your class. So really the main idea here is just getting them to think deeply about these ideas. Um, and I, I strongly believe that creating metaphors or analogies or similes or whatever you want to call them, it really is sort of a deeper order of thinking, um, and it really helps them, even if it's out of anger that they didn't get it right or out of anger that they didn't think about it the way that you did. Um, I really, truly believe it helps them understand um, and remember. Okay, so let's summarize real quick. Um, so the idea is to contextualize the argument of the framers um, and make sure you use the word framers because I found out that nobody really remembers that and they usually read it as farmers anyways. Um, and that is the idea of balance of power. So you probably saw that theme throughout the presentation, the whole idea that they're afraid of somebody abusing power and they put all these little pieces into the constitution to prevent that from happening. Um, so definitely try and contextualize and then expand. And then this continuing idea of, you know, how do you create this government? Is it efficient? You know, um, there are a lot of arguments to say democracy is one of the most inefficient ways. Um, but you know, some people argue that it is the best way. Um, so how do you create this perfect balance where you can still get things done, still prevent one person or group of people from having too much power, 
um, but still also have, you know, the voice of the people heard. So a lot of things going on. And then lastly, you know, connect to modern day, connect to modern day, connect to modern day. Um, that really helps our students understand. And there is just a multitude of things that you could bring in that are happening in modern times um, that you could say, is this constitutional? Is it not? Um, what does the Constitution say about this? Um, so First Amendment is a big one. Uh, that's usually the easiest one for them to understand just because, you know, they always want to speak their mind. But, you know, there are certain rules depending on where you are. So, um, like always, hopefully you have found at least one thing that you can use in your classroom or one helpful sort of idea. And thanks for watching.